welcome to our worship on the first Sunday of 2023. I hope you all had a blessed Christmas. No, I hope you're still having a blessed Christmas. It isn't over until it's over and it isn't over until the 6th of January. This is the first Sunday of the new year, but it's also the first Sunday after Christmas. And it seemed only right for us to stand down our heroic worship team from the labours for this week. So this will be a slightly different service then, but, but we'll be seeing a further evolution over the next few weeks. I retire at the end of February and with the beginning of Sunday morning live streaming soon, we'll be moving step by step towards the way we'll be enfolding you all, our online congregation, even more into the worship of the one community, physically co-present and virtually but vibrantly present, that the UCB already is. We've all learned new ways of being human over the last almost three years. Perhaps, perhaps we've also learned even more about the humanity we share, about God, and about what it means to say that the Son took our human nature and the Word became flesh. And maybe what we're also saying is that between online worship and keeping in touch with friends and family scattered throughout the world on Zoom, FaceTime and WhatsApp, We've all learned more about the real meaning of Christmas, too. So, welcome to our online worship. Let us pray. Our Christmas, gracious God, was not white. We can be so sentimental, but we know that snow has significance for faith. Snow is cleansing and snow is hope. Snow is forgiveness and snow is grace. The prophet promises us in your name. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. We bring the failures that have besmirched our living, the shabbiness of our thoughts and deeds the grey dullness of our thinking and living, 
now our arrogant conviction that what is off-white is white as snow. Forgive us, Lord, though our sins be scarlet, make them as white as snow, that we may begin again today to live for you, to reflect the radiance of Christ, and to embark on the untouched snowfield of a new year, marking our track into its days and months, with footsteps placed into the footsteps of the one who goes before us, the author and pioneer of our faith, in him, born for us, dying for us, rising again for us, we discover our forgiveness. Amen. I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us, and the great favour to the house of Israel that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their saviour in all their distress. It was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old.
this epigram from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which seems to me to sum up so much of the meaning of the Christian faith and of Christmas. If Jesus Christ is not true God, how could he help us? If he is not true man, how could he help us? Since a lot of my books are all over the place with us moving, I couldn't find my copy of the anthology of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's writings called True Patriotism, where that quote can be found. And that's a particularly poignant title, True Patriotism, because it reflects the agonising position of those Germans who resisted Hitler and the toxic worship of nation, blood and soil that the Nazis corrupted patriotism into believing that only what seemed to their crazed compatriots as the deepest form of treachery could somehow redeem the German identity when the madness was at an end. This position between, between a disaster that human beings had made for themselves and things as they should be and would be, was one that many of his co-conspirators acted on because of sheer moral revulsion. It was all they could do and they must have wondered would that be enough? For those among them, however, whose resistance was framed by their Christian faith, there was a pattern here. Christian faith calls us to stand where Jesus stood, to be where Jesus was, because Jesus is where we are. Jesus came to us where we are. And if Jesus comes to us where we are, then God is where we are. That's what Christmas means. Christmas as Bonhoeffer tells us unambiguously, is all about this. Christmas is about God coming to be where we are, but in a very particular way. I told you I hunted for my copy of True Patriotism. I wanted to be sure I'd got the quote absolutely right. I couldn't find it, so I googled for the words. I searched for precisely this. Bonhoeffer, if he was not God, how could he help us? Quote. And I found the quote. It was replicated in several websites and I remembered it correctly. I looked at a few of them and my heart sank. I'll go into that a little bit more after the next reading, the great passage from the anonymous letter to the Hebrews, which explores what is, after all, the central theme of Christmas and the first thing we should see when we look into the manger, the humanity that we share with Jesus. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. But it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. As I say, I was googling for that wonderfully rich and compact quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if Jesus is not true God, how could he help us? If he is not true man, how could he help us? And when I found it, and because of where I found it, I got really annoyed. There it was on several websites, all of which were using it to make a similar point. And it was the use that they put the words to. Jesus being true God, Jesus being true man, the doctrine of the virgin birth and the creeds, well, fair enough. But then they went on to explain what Bonhoeffer is saying, that Jesus can only be the incarnate second person of the Trinity. Now your eyes crossing from the heavy theological language yet, bear with me, this isn't going where you might think it's going. Jesus can only be the incarnate second person of the Trinity if the doctrine of the virgin birth is true and therefore if you don't or can't accept the doctrine of the virgin birth then there's nothing that Jesus can do for you. And I read all this and I became very angry. 
if you heard all the big theological words and felt depressed or exhausted or anxious and despairing, or if you were just so hacked off that you mumbled, oh, for goodness sake, life's too short. And especially if all you heard was the last bit and the suggestion that you're the kind of person that Jesus just isn't for, well, it was on your behalf that I was angry. It's people whose position is basically believe what I tell you, believe exactly what I tell you and in exactly the way I believe it or you're off to the bad fire who actively come between the gospel and the people it's meant to be good news for. People like you, people like me, people who live in the 24-7 real world of mobile phones and sat-nav and computers, people like the normal people who wonder if the Christian faith really is a package deal. If you can't accept all of it, you aren't accepting any of it, and so you're not a Christian. People who don't want to pay the huge entrance fee for a religion that insists that you hand in your brain at the door before they let you in. People, and there are millions of them out there, who can't make sense of the Christian faith for 11 months of the year and don't even think about it, but who at Christmas hear the old familiar story and start wondering. And Bonhoeffer tells them what Luke's gospel tells them, that a baby lies in a manger and gurgles after a birth as human as yours or mine, and that God confronts us in the humanity of that baby and loves us and accepts us as only God can, the God who made us to know God's love in all its fullness. Now, if you can trust that, you can answer Bonhoeffer's question. If Jesus Christ is not true God, how could he help us? If he's not true man, how could he help us? Well, he couldn't, but he does. Faith isn't a matter of turning off your brain and insisting or pretending that you can obediently accept everything that's in a creed or pretend you can. Faith is a matter of trusting what the creeds, the gospel and the preaching of the church hold out to you. The God who, in love, comes to our aid, meets us where we are, stands with us in our humanity and overcomes where we were powerless. I think that the people who come to church at Christmas are looking for something they can trust. My job for 41 years has been to tell them that they can trust that. That's why we didn't leave the Christmas story at the point where the wise men saddle up their camels and go home on a route that doesn't take them past Herod's palace. That's where nativity plays end. You couldn't take a nativity play beyond the wise men's arrival at the cot into the horror of what happens next. But we have to follow the story there. Now, after they had left... An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfil what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt have I called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled, because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who are seeking the child's life are dead. And then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after having been warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. That last part of the story is the one that impresses on us what it means to say that in Jesus Christ, God is found where we have to live our lives. We turn on the television 
click from news website to news website or just open the paper and we contemplate the suffering, injustice and violence of the world and we ask, where is God in all of this? If we can trust what Bonhoeffer is saying, God is there in the child who is in mortal danger, the child who barely escapes, the child who has to live with the refugees and the homeless. That's where God is to be found, in the humanity of Jesus Christ, which is exactly the same as your humanity and mine. Jesus of Nazareth grew up, became a man and died in a world that knew its own horrors, but not those of our world in which tragedies were felt immediately in the communities that experienced them, but weren't turned into global news by global media. But he was born and died. And in the gospel of his resurrection, in the preaching of the church and in the encounter of prayer, we encounter him as the one who is as human as us. And meeting with him, we encounter God as love and grace and forgiveness. We could keep Jesus of Nazareth as a figure from 2,000 years ago whose staggeringly beautiful birth story moves us emotionally but doesn't touch our real lives. Or we can encounter him as the presence of God in our own human nature and know that we are understood. And we could look at our televisions, the streamed news on our devices or the papers whose crosswords we do and we could imagine the human realities that we really don't want to read about as part of a human reality in which God is to be found with those who flee and are persecuted and hurt and killed. And we might think of the joys and sorrows of our own lives, the hopes and fears, and know that God knows these things too. And we might be filled with hope and even energised to do things which defy a cold, loveless world because we've seen the Christ in the people we could help and in the people who help us. Now that would be the stage for a corker of a New Year's resolution, wouldn't it? And if we did that, we'd have found the bridge between God and our own lives that is what Bonhoeffer is talking about and what Christmas really is all about. If Jesus Christ is not true God, how could he help us? If he is not true man, how could he help us? Well, he couldn't, could he? But then he does, doesn't he? And our prayers of intercession this morning are structured around the carol, 
once in Royal David City. Let us pray. And he leads his children on to the place where he has gone. We pray for the church, the pilgrim people of Christ, stirred up from and in the ordinary life of the world, to follow where he calls. We pray for the pilgrim people of Christ as they walk in his way, calling the world to rise and seek the kingdom. We pray for the world and the lives of all who are with us, members of the human family, bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh. We pray for those whom we know in their sadness and in their joy, seeking the growth in us of the loving compassion of Jesus, the Son of God, who is our brother. He was little, weak and helpless. Tears and smiles like us he knew. And his shelter was a stable, and his cradle was a stall, where the poor and mean and lowly lived on earth our Saviour holy. Help us, your Church, to know the challenge of Christ, to identify, as he did and does, with those who have nothing, those who are considered nothing, those who believe themselves to be nothing and nothing worth. Let his passionate identification rebuke us, now our compassion is a circle drawn tight around us and those whom we know. Our empathy fails and our sympathy is empty noise. Help us now to pray for those in need all over the earth. We pray for each other, and we pray for ourselves, not in the grip of selfishness or self-absorption, but because we know our need. We ask this in his name, who feeleth for our sadness and who shareth in our gladness. Fill us, your church, with hope to share, and inspire our life and our work with hope, the hope that, not in that poor lowly stable, shall we see him, but in heaven, set at God's right hand on high that he who shall come again to judge the living and the dead will bring to completion your kingdom, and that your will be done here as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you now and evermore. Amen.